Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the trustees, director general, and staff of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vasu Sangralay and Museum Society of Mumbai, I extend a warm welcome. We wish you all a very happy, prosperous, and healthy New Year. Today we are presenting 22nd Kal Khandarwala Memorial Lecture. The Kal Khandarwala Memorial Lecture was instituted after its sad demise by the Museum Society of Mumbai in collaboration with the museum in the year 1998. Kal Khandarwala was associated with this museum as chairman over three decades, a rare privilege for the museum to have such a renowned scholar as chairman. The lecture was started as homage to this great scholar and art historian. It is one of the prestigious annual lecture at the museum. The first Karl Khandalwala Memorial Lecture was delivered by Dr. Jagdish Mittal, a noted art collector, scholar, and a close associate of Karl Khandalwala. Thereafter, many distinguished scholars have delivered this prestigious lecture on different aspects of Indian art and culture. This year, we have Naman Ahuja, Professor of Art History, Dean of School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, to deliver 22nd Karl Khandalwala Memorial Lecture. We are thankful to Professor Naman Ahuja for accepting our invitation. His studies on ancient terracottas and other small finds have drawn attention to the foundation of Indian visual culture. It has led to various publications and curatorial projects that explore aesthetics of Indian iconography, transculturism in antiquity, as well as historiography of arts and crafts movement. He has edited and co-authored numerous research papers as well as books. He is the author of Making of Modern Indian Artist Devi Prasad, The Body in Indian Art and Thought, and more recently he has catalogued the collections of Australian Museum Oxford, titled The Art and Archaeology of Ancient India, Earliest Times to Sixth Century. His today's lecture, Quotidian Histories, Curating Everyday Objects, is based on same research. We are once again thankful to Professor Naman Ahuja for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture. We are also thankful to all our friends, well-wishers, who have always encouraged us for organizing a wide range of activities and lectures. Thank you once again and over to Naman Ahuja for the lecture. I'd like to thank you all, uh, particularly the trustees of the CSMVS Museum and Sabisachi Mukherjee for the invitation to be able to speak to you today about researching the quotidian. The talk is really about a book that I wrote relatively recently called The Art and Archaeology of Ancient India. Um, it's a catalog of the Ashmolean Museum's collection in Oxford. And rather than just focus on the highlights of the collection, what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about the stories that went into the objects, the collectors, and my methodology in the writing of this book. Why have I titled the talk Researching the Quotidian? The quotidian, or that which is a part of everyday life, has suddenly become an important genre of scholarship once again. This time because work from home has become the new normal. So everyday life has become something that the world is privy to. We have seen that what happens at home is not the same as what happens publicly. Different contexts, circumstances, rituals, practices and even people who normally get ignored or not accounted for or ever spoken about open up a view of the past that is otherwise denied to us if we study only public monuments or literary texts which were written by and for those who were literate. So how do we tell the stories of those who were not necessarily literate? I would like in today's talk to take you not just through a slideshow of some of the interesting things in the book, but use those objects to reflect on how we can build up a rich history about the past. I'd like to focus in my lecture on other questions that are germane to museums today. My first intention is obvious. How was the Ashmolean Museum's rich and representative collection formed? 
What is the nature of research required to develop the curatorial concerns and narratives that are relevant for our times? Right at the outset, I should say that this book began when Andrew Topsfield, who was then the curator and then later keeper of the Eastern Art Department of the Ashmolean, and Neil Kreitman, who is a collector with a very fine eye, created a grant that allowed me to be a research fellow at the Ashmolean for a few years. I began work on this catalogue at a time when I could still profit from exchanges with older scholars, Simon Digby and James Hall, who had both served the Ashmolean for much of their careers. I'd like to begin by thinking of those people with gratitude. The catalogue as it now stands comprises about 163 catalogue entries, but some of those catalogue entries contain about 40 items each. And when you add it all up, it's a catalogue that has about 480 objects in it. It was never really intended that the catalogue would have quite as many objects as it now does. But many more objects began to come to light as the old premises of the Ashmolean was decanted when it was going through its refurbishment and the new Ashmolean was getting created. In fact, you could say that the Ashmolean that I joined in 2001 was quite different to the one that published the book two years ago. However, even this big book is not really a complete catalogue of everything that the Ashmolean contains from ancient India. We've left out the objects from Gandhara, for instance. The objects from medieval India are yet to be written up. The paintings of the Ashmolean comprise a third and a fourth catalogue, um, all their own. So I'm only going to focus on the objects that were made from earliest times up until what we call the post-Gupta period, which is broadly about the 6th century AD. When we talk about things like Gandhara, medieval, Indian paintings from Rajasthan or Mughal style. These are all categories that you are very familiar with. You've all heard these terms today. But at the time when the Ashmolean's collections were being made, these were not well-defined categories. Collectors were just collecting things from all over the place and putting them together. So as a result, what happens is that the Ashmolean contains objects that don't come from any one neat category or the other. They come from those in-between periods and new research had to be done. In fact, one can say that collections like the Ashmoleans were at the forefront of defining those very categories that we today hold so sacrosanct as the very periods of Indian art. But the Ashmolean contains objects that don't fit into those categories. Some do, but many don't. And as a result, they couldn't be slotted into any of the neat chapters that I had developed for the book. And that necessitated a new chapter, a sixth chapter in the book, which was on the subject called miscellanea. Now, this category is one that I think requires a little explanation. There are Neolithic tools that imitate Bronze Age ones. So where do you slot them? in the Neolithic or in the Bronze Age. There are objects that were collected by people who thought that they were genuine, but today research has revealed that they are fake. Where do you slot those? There are objects which seem to be made in one place, but they are also found in other places. So which chapter do you put them in? Which region do you slot them in? And then there are objects which were identical over many centuries, millennia sometimes, and so you don't know where to chronologically place them. And all of these things came together to confound one to a point that it required this chapter called miscellanea at the end of the whole book. So let me begin by showing you just two examples of these kinds. This plaque of a female attendant looks as if it is of a late Kushan style. But a close inspection of the plaque raised suspicion in my mind because the edges of the plaque are all uniformly raised. Whereas being a fragment and not a real edge, they should actually be all along the same plane. Then I realized that the texture of the terracotta was also just a little too smooth. 
and not like the thousands of other terracottas I had handled from that period of ancient India. A photograph of the object would never have alerted me to these inconsistencies. And I mention this because as a teacher and as a museum curator, we have to remember that online lectures and virtual learning can never really substitute for the true object-based learning that we need in our profession. There was something else about this object that irked me. I felt that I had seen it before. So I started rummaging through my old notebooks and I found the one that I had used on a field trip to Allahabad about four or five years earlier. And I found that I had made note of an almost identical object that was even broken in exactly the same places. And when I examined my notes, I found that my measurements of it revealed that it was just fractionally larger than the one at the Ashmolean. And it began to seem as if somebody had made a mold out of the piece in the Allahabad Museum and then made another impression of that. And that had wound up at the Ashmolean Museum. And this was all perfectly normal because the molded impression made from the original would have been fractionally smaller than the one that was lying in the Allahabad Museum. Plus, as I said, the edges were turned up. So if this was actually a part of a larger plug, there should be no raised edges. But I wasn't convinced of my own deductive reasoning. So I asked for the piece to be scientifically tested. And we asked the people who run the laboratories in Keeble Road in Oxford to come and conduct thermoluminescence tests on this piece. And they, of course, verified that the piece was modern. I mentioned this to you because I want you to understand that researching one collection was dependent on knowing intimately other collections that had objects like this. It required years of familiarity with handling excavated pieces to know about the texture that they should have. It warranted knowing how to catalog them as precisely as one could. It warranted securing the funds to travel to all these different places and do the fieldwork that was necessary. And it warranted also a spirit of collaboration to work with people who specialize in other disciplines like scientists to be able to work together to analyze objects. And I hope this is a spirit of collaboration that we can foster in our own museums, in our institutions in India. There were other objects that also had to be examined closely to see not if they were fake, because I don't want to keep talking about those types of objects, but I want to show you a different kind of object to be able to study what else constituted miscellanea. Now this bronze ewer was made in the first to second centuries AD. Research on its modern conservation had allowed me to establish what parts of it were original. It allowed me to establish an analysis of the metallurgy and this confirmed that the object was in fact consistent with ancient bronzes. And the fact that there were depictions of such bronze ewers in the sculptures that were made in ancient India also allowed me to be able to date the object fairly precisely. It turned out that such objects have been found in ancient Gandhara and it was a standard design for ritual vessels from that time. So this time it was not the scientific research that was intriguing me but the research into the provenance of this piece. The ewer was reportedly found in South Vietnam. Research on a related object in the Cleveland Museum drew my attention to excavated pieces from Gandhara, sites like Takshila and Begram, and also to Hellenistic ewers. It led me to closely examine sculptures to see if there were depictions of those objects on those sculptures. And I found that spherical or quat ovoid pots with curving handles over the rim were a standard feature of ancient Indian design. They're known to us from several relief carvings ranging from Bharut in the 2nd century BC to Gandhara and Amravati all the way up to the 3rd century AD. But the point was, what on earth was this object doing in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam? This object hadn't been found in any of the places where it would have been 
made. Now, we had enough research to know that ancient Indians were trading with Southeast Asia, with Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and even South Vietnam, where this object was found. Studying a Kushan Gandharan object found in the Mekong Delta was exciting. It may have been made in Gandhara, but it had gone to Vietnam along with a monk from the ports of Amaravati or Chandraketugarh, maybe. The two port towns of Chandraketugarh and Amaravati, in fact, along with the site of Tamluk, were places that I was going to spend much time studying while writing this book. In fact, I owed the award of the fellowship that permitted me the chance to write this book to the fact that the Ashmolean owns the most famous ancient terracotta object from one of the most ancient ports of India. Originally from Tamluk in Bengal, she is now better known as the Oxford Yakshi. She's so famous that she is, of course, the cover girl of the book that I'm here to talk about. Now, although a few thousand comparable pieces have been found of the same broad style, this plaque was the first one of this type to ever be discovered. And it remains the most well-known of all ancient Indian terracottas. It is used as the standard against which the style of post-Mauryan art is measured. Most people who have talked about this piece have noticed that the goddess is clad in a very diaphanous drapery that is wound around her body and draped over her left shoulder, rather like the way a modern sari would be worn. She wears very elaborate jewelry all over her body and her costume, her turban are quite exceptional and that's made her quite important for a study of ancient Indian costume. She sports an elaborate tripartite headdress a conical element in the centre and a large turban-like arrangement on the left. But it is the right side which has five weapons in it that attracted the most amount of scholarly attention. The weapons in the goddess's headdress may be identified as an ankush or what we call an elephant goad, a spear or a dagger, a hatchet or axe, and two forms of tridents or trishuls, respectively. Her extravagant jewellery includes in her left ear a large disc, while if you look in her right ear, the same disc is at the end of a laterally projecting cylinder. And then there are these tassels of pearls that are suspended from both the discs and in fact there are little pearl-like stipples all over her body. Art historians are often accused of labouring their descriptions, but with this object, the more I zoomed into it with my camera, the more there was to describe and talk about. In fact, what can be said about it is that this elaboration, this jewellery, was in fact the very point that the artist was trying to communicate. So what is it in this jewellery that is so important? My attention was drawn to the goddess's huge belt, which is slung low and asymmetrically across her hips. What was intriguing about it were the tassels that fall from this belt that are shaped into pot-bellied little dwarf yakshas. The technical term for them is a kumbhanda, he who has a belly like a kumbha anda or a, a pot belly. These little figures are dangling over her thighs. These talismans are rich with symbolic significance. Similarly, I noticed that there were other talismans on her body as well. Let's look at the diagonal jewellery that is worn across her torso, for instance. That sash is made up of three mythical creatures, a bird, a makar or a crocodile, which has a curling fishtail, and an elephant, which rather curiously also has a curling tail of a fish. So from the tool or weapon-shaped pins on her head to the tassels on her thighs to these animals and birds which are on her torso, there was something quite talismanic about this jewellery on her body. And that makes us think about what all this jewellery is trying to communicate. What does it all mean?
Researching the quotidian opens up questions that we would not normally have considered if we were just studying the objects that are made in the public art or things that have been written about in the textual literature. We have normally been given to understand that the purpose of an image in India is to take darshan, to look at an image and to be looked back by the energy that is inherent in that. It's supposed to be a two-way visual exchange. But what we're looking at on this object is that these are things that are not meant to be looked at alone, but they're meant to be touched. They obviously give the lady power because she possesses them, because they touch her skin. Talismanic objects operate very differently. They are to be touched, not just seen. And this takes us to an aspect of religion that we normally think about as superstition. These are things that are almost never written down in texts. The quotidian is also the realm of the private sphere. It is the place for women and children. It's a space for families. It is not the space of just what happens on the Grand Taj Mahals and the Buddhist stupas, which art historians normally study. It's not the realm of those who are literate, for instance, and who compose their fine poetry in Sanskrit or Persian, but it takes us into the world of those who may not necessarily have been literate. It takes us into a world where superstition matters. It takes us into a world where rituals and festivals can be perhaps studied better than they would have been through the texts. It also takes us, as I was just hinting, at the world of women and children and away from the literate masculine and patriarchal domain that normally inflects our understanding of Indian art history. So by contrast, the kind of objects that we are looking at in this book allows us to focus on those little things, the everyday things that people used in their homes or that made up their everyday lives. Things that were easily affordable and they make for a rich telling of history that takes us to narratives that are harder to tell if we were just curators of court art. The image itself is of a fairly standard type. A small female standing with one arm akimbo is found widely, as I said, in thousands of examples between 200 BC and AD 200. Just like this very extraordinary jewel, which is made of amber and was found somewhere in the northwest frontier of Pakistan or perhaps in Afghanistan. Its iconography and style make it look just like a Mauryan period piece from Mathura or somewhere like that. But it's made of amber. Now, this little jewel is important because we know that amber isn't found in India. In fact, we have very good references from Roman sources that tell us that the usual source of amber that they were used to from Sicily had dried up by that time, by the first century AD. And they had started importing their own amber to make some fabulous things that they would make at that time um, from the Baltic region, from Central Europe. So it means that somewhere in the Scythian or Seleucid period, in about the second century BC, traders had brought Baltic amber to Gandhara, where locals used it to carve a jewel that they found important with iconography that was relevant to them in that region. And that iconography happens to be of the same type of goddess. I found other examples as well, sometimes even made of gold. And these ones were kept in boxes which contained the relics of a monk or the Buddha and were kept interred inside stupas. So perhaps this little amber object was also once a relic deposit, just like those gold ones were in Bihar and in UP. Now, when studying objects which have these weapon-shaped hairpins coming out of their 
um, turbans, Stella Cramrish gave them the name Apsara Panchachuda. But the problem is that we've now found hundreds of examples, including one at the Ashmolean, where there are figures who have 10 weapons in their hairdo, and there's no ancient name mentioned in any Vedic text or any other text for a Dashachuda. We've even found ladies that have 12 hairpins, and there's no word called Dvadashachuda or Shadachuda for the six weaponed figures that we find so commonly. So I'm not really sure that Stella Kramrish was on the right track when she chose this name Panchachuda based on the name of a particular Apsara who is mentioned in the Vedic sources on the story of the churning of the ocean. Um, and I think there must be another name for these figures. Or perhaps these figures are not alluding to any one iconographic type of person, but might be referring to a generic style of that time. Before Cramrish, E.H. Johnston, the famous Sanskrit scholar, gave her the name Maya, not named after the Buddhist goddess Maya, but named after a, an Egyptian figure whom he related to the Greek goddess Kibele and to the Central Asian goddess Nana, and said that she might be an ancient form of the mother goddess. But the scholar uh, S.K. Saraswati completely disagreed with that, and he thought it safer and better simply to call her a Yakshi. Then Pratapaditya Pal came up with another hypothesis, and he said that these weapons cannot be ignored, and maybe this figure should really be called a Proto Durga. But the problem was that I began to find figures where this lady with the weapons is sometimes standing on a lotus inside a water tank which is normally the standard iconography for the goddess Lakshmi. And because these goddesses began to look as much like Lakshmi as they did like Durga, it became questionable whether we should be calling her Durga at all. This also made me question whether the weapons are indeed an iconographic attribute, whether we should be using the weapons to give her a name because she comes up in Buddhist contexts, she comes up in Lakshmi-like contexts. She might be a Durga-type figure. She may be related to a Vedic myth. She may be just a standard Yakshi. Maybe this was just a way of saying something important about the talismans that she wears in her hair. In the examples that are found from Haryana and Punjab, she doesn't always have weapons. Sometimes when she has them, they are counterbalanced on the other side of her hairdo with an equal number of sprigs of foliage. So weapons for protection and productivity, which is symbolically conveyed through the foliage, the ears of corn and wheat that you see on the other side, seem to be the two things that she is communicating, productivity and protection simultaneously. These then seem to be more like symbols of power and beauty, not limited to goddess figures alone at that time. They made me therefore question whether these figures were always to be regarded as something cultic. Now I'll give you another example. Take these figures which have been found in Bannu in the northwest frontier. The Ashmolean has two examples of these. The weapon-shaped protrusions right at the end of the hairpin seem to have fallen off them, but we can see that they were still emerging out of the figures. In the center of these little statuettes, you will find that there's a socket. And scholars have suggested that they would have been used as either handles for an object like, for instance, a mirror, or they could have even been legs of furniture. Now, furniture legs and mirror handles, suddenly this weapon-shaped hairpins are on very secular objects and they're not associated with anything cultic at all. And that takes us actually to a much more serious theoretical, methodological question when we examine the quotidian. Objects that can be used for rituals can also be used for secular purposes. When we study them in a temple, they may be given a ritual meaning. But when you study them in a home, they may be used, as I said, sometimes for ritual, 
but sometimes for a totally secular purpose. I mean, we should be familiar with this paradigm in Indian art history. Um, the images of gods, for instance, you can even see them outside the CSMVS Museum in Mumbai, right here in the Kalakhoda area, where you see images of gods are put on bathroom tiles as transfers and placed outside walls, not for people to worship them, but to prevent men from urinating on those walls. So you're using the image of a god, not for any cultic and religious purpose at all. Or take another object, like for instance, a common enough thing like a diya. Uh, you know, people use a diya every day in their home to light a, light a flame, um, which is the very basis for performing a ritual. It's such a pure and simple sacred object. But at the same time, in many a drawing room or in many a student's hostel room, you will find that the lip of the diya is being used very comfortably to balance a cigarette and the object is being used as an ashtray. Now, however profane it may seem to us, or sacrilegious even, the fact is that we don't know how that object was used by somebody in their home. Similarly, the talismans on this figure, which are made up of these morphed creatures, show that she occupies the power of moving between worlds, of moving between the aquatic and the terrestrial, between the aerial and the aquatic between supporting her pregnant belly on the one hand to offering protection, to offering productivity. I wonder sometimes whether the modern designer John Galliano was thinking the same thing. I don't know if he's been collecting Shunga and Satvahana terracottas or not, or if he was directly inspired by them. But I mean, just look at this. The, collect the connection does seem to be quite remarkable. So coming back to the issue that I've been trying to draw your attention to. Conducting microscopic examination of an object, the discipline of knowing how to catalog it, writing careful descriptions, allows a researcher to link it with other objects of that age. And it opens up art historical studies in many new ways. For instance, when I first saw this piece in the Ashmolean's collection, I was a little amused and I was a little impressed. I thought I might have stumbled upon the world's first iconographic depiction of the god Ganesh. After all, it does show a figure with an elephant head on a human body. But as my research deepened, I found not one, but four other pieces that seem to have been pressed out of exactly the same mold. They all had different parts of the plaque. And as I began to piece this jigsaw together, I found that they were all pretty thin figures. None of them was like a pot-bellied Ganesh and they were all wearing elephant-headed masks, not natural elephant heads. They were also making merry, they were playing musical instruments, and one of them was dancing in front of a Chaitya shrine. This immediately revealed a different world, a world of rituals, masked performances, things that haven't really been written up in our texts at all about what were the kinds of rituals that took place at these ancient Chaityas. We find the archeology span of the Chaityas and the Stupas, but we don't know what went on there. And so perhaps these flocks preserve evidence of a different kind. The writing of this book opened up many difficult and different types of episodes for me. I remember one day Andrew Topsfield asked me if I'd like to consider writing something about the four bricks that had come from Gopalpur that were lying in the museum's collection. So I thought I'd take a stab at it. And what arrived at my desk were not four bricks, but four terracotta tablets. They were inscribed on both sides, rather like a manuscript. Now, I'd seen many copper plate inscriptions, but I wasn't familiar with terracotta inscriptions. These objects come from Gopalpur, which is about 28 miles south of Gorakhpur, which is right there in the ancient Buddhist heartland. The story goes, that a large number of bricks began to be recorded from the site of Gopalpur in about the 1840s. And by about 1895, 
a pandit ram garib chobe had been offering them for sale to vincent smith who chose to write about them and then they were collected and brought to the ashbolian the tablets came allegedly from a small 8 foot square chamber all these bricks by the way from these monuments were being commandeered or raided by the labor in those villages allegedly for building indigo vats um which is what the company what well by that time the british uh, government was trying to promote the the dyeing of indigo and the production of indigo in that region and um uh, these tablets were spared from being reused as spolia for the recon- for the construction of those vats because they were inscribed apparently these four tablets were found deposited on a ledge in a subterranean crypt which also contained a large number of 11 kushan coins from about the 1st century AD the coins of hovishka and vima kadfaisis and um, kanishk but the strange thing was that the writing on this particular plaque didn't look like it was kushan period at all so whereas the coins were kushan the paleography was certainly of a later date and it seemed that somebody who had made a stupa or a chaitya at a later time used older precious coins in that deposit now this kind of thing if you use only the discipline of associated assemblages of numismatics with the object would make you put it in the kushan period but if you study the paleography you would put it in a different chapter which would be in the chapter on on the gupta or post gupta or maybe not even in this catalog because this catalog was to end in the 6th century ad and there was a good reason to believe that the handwriting on these objects was actually of a later date so where would these objects fit in the four tablets if you look at them are not of the same size they are each about 1 inch thick but their length and their width vary they are inscribed on both sides and at least two different forms of handwriting can be discerned one has larger akshars or larger letters with more spaces between them and is in an altogether more rapid handwriting while the majority of the plaques or tablets seem to be in a more careful smaller tighter hand i hadn't anticipated that my research would lead me to so closely examine someone that i was reading their handwriting not a monumental inscription on a public uh stone uh for everyone to read but somebody's own handwriting the tablets all have versions of the same sutra the pratyekta samutpada sutra written on them which is the sutra of dependent origination which is probably one of the most important sutras of ancient buddhism it must have been copied by monks who were listening to an abbot reciting it the sutra is one of the central teachings of buddhism and is called the chain of the dependent origination in english it explains what causes suffering and the means to stop it this most essential of buddhist sutras then was considered to be of such singular importance that it was kept interred in a crypt which must have contained relics paleographically the handwriting at first seems misleading but most of the akshars are related to a gupta period brahmi script however because they have conjoined letters below them they were thought by some historians to be early tibetan i spent a wonderful few months graduating from early inscriptional brahmi which i had been taught to read in the years that i was doing my phd to learning about gupta period inscriptions and gupta paleography and epigraphy to finally moving my way into proto nevari pala period scripts and even early tibetan to be able to read what these these tablets had to say as a result i was able to slightly correct and amend the full transcript of the inscriptions which had been noted by the sanskritist e h johnston as early as 1938 here then was another group of objects that was neither of the gupta period nor of the kushan 
neither necessarily Tibetan nor Bala, but somewhere in between all these categories. I mention all this to you to be able to bring your attention to the fact that writing museum catalogue collections can require a lot more research than one had originally anticipated. There were other objects that were much easier to write up, however, and let me show you some of those. There were masterpieces that came from well-known periods of Indian art, or the types that come from well-known monuments. So these were easy things to slot. For instance, this fine Gupta period Shiva, this amazing and massive head of a grimacing yaksha from Mathura, probably an atlas. He looks as if he's suffering as his eyes tell us he's holding up the weight of a building or a roof. Or this very refined and classic important sandstone Vishnu from the Gupta period that closely resembles an example that lies in the National Museum in Delhi. It wasn't these kinds of things, but it was the little things that were really posing a challenge in the course of writing this catalogue. A most unusual portable image of Narasimha from the Peshawar region, which is in the shape of a lion, but it has an image of Vishnu made inside it. It looks to be a personal shrine, something that was portable, something that a family that migrated from the Peshawar Valley could have carried away with them once. Or the many tiny but wonderful objects from Chandraketugar, like this erotic talisman for fertility that might have been used in someone's home. The expressive objects that capture the romantic mood of lovers, like these kissing kinners from Kashmir, this probably would have been the lid of a box that must have contained some rather special substance. Was it an aphrodisiac, one wonders? The domestic does, of course, take us into very reasonable speculation along personal lines, people's sexual mores, their ritual behavior, their private worlds, their superstitions. These embracing lovers from Tamluk are amongst the oldest and most critical pieces to study the visual or iconographic codification of the Ras of Sringar. Importantly, we see this kind of Sringar not on the public monuments of the second century BC in India, but here so tenderly captured in a little terracotta. They tell us about the spirit of the age and once again, how the aesthetics of what was created in the religious and public spheres of temples was informed by what was being made and used at home. The objects in this collection taught me a lot. One day I walked into my office and there were three trolleys lying there <laughs> with a little note that again I might like to consider including them in my catalogue. So ever curious, I opened up these boxes and I was exasperated because they contained fragments or shards of pots. Now, I was quite familiar with pottery shards. I'd spent my PhD years studying uh, pottery shards. I'd photographed something like 5,000 the, of them on little 35 millimeter slides. I had learned to thin section them and look at them under a microscope to see what kind of clay or fabric they were made of. I had been taught how to analyze the, 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 the clay body. In fact, um, I remember my pottery master, Devi Prasad, telling me that um, my fingers were not sensitive enough. And in fact, even Gordon Lang, the expert of Chinese ceramics at Sotheby's, used to tell me the same thing. Uh, they both said that you have to learn how to lick the ceramic to be able to tell what kind of clay body it's really made of, because only your tongue is really sensitive enough to know what firing temperature that clay has been taken to. Well, I'd, I'd tried other things. I'd scratched these shards in my time to be able to see what consistency they had. I remember once even um, uh, in the Department of Archaeology in West Bengal, uh, they had lots of examples of one particular type of shard and 
um, I held one of them under a faucet of water to see whether the pigment on it would run off to see whether it had really adhered with the body. And in another example, I remember holding it under a very fast faucet to see whether the kaolin or china clay had really fused with the earthenware at the back, uh, which, the clay, which the pot was really made of, to see what, what firing temperature it had been taken to. I mean, my, my methods for research in terms of object handling were very unconventional. And these are not the kind of methods that today one gets to teach one's students. I mean, I don't even know if my methods would be considered legal. Licking and scratching and sniffing and rubbing and, you know, wetting museum pieces. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how much I can, how much time I can spend with my students teaching them these things anymore. So however unconventional my methods may have been, the fact remains that they had given me the kind of empirical experience that had landed me my fellowship to write this book at the Ashmolean. And I mentioned that to educators and museum directors and pedagogues, my own colleagues today, to understand how important study collections really can be. A little fragment, a little pottery shard, or shard can hold many secrets therefore. Examined carefully, it can tell you what part of a pot it comes from. It can provide clues about the shape the full pot once may have had. So you can see that it might come from a shoulder of a pot or it might come from the base of a pot and from that basis you can conjecture what the rest of the pot's curvature would have been like. You can then tell whether it's the type of pot or shard that was used for holding grain or holding liquid. Was it a pot that was being used for cooking or storing? But not all pottery shards need be for pots. Clay objects are the basis of all construction. It could be the portion of a drain. It could be the portion of a roof. So again, we're coming into a domestic realm, a construction realm, a world of the everyday. So from learning to handle objects, I'd like to talk about the opportunities that one gets as a scholar to do that. And a critical part of that, in terms of researching these objects, is predicated on conducting fieldwork. Fieldwork then by the collectors who made these objects. And let's look at the fieldwork now, which I conduct, let's say, when I go with my students and take them to some sites to study uh, fragments or I remember, for instance, going to the Sundarbans, where I saw hundreds and hundreds of fragments that had been washed up on the shore of Kakdweep and some of the other islands in the Sundarbans. Some of these islands don't even have names, they're just numbers, because I was trying to find a context and a meaning for all these early Chandraketu Garshads, but these ones that I was looking at on the table at the Ashmolean weren't quite grey enough and light enough to be like the Chandraketu ones. They weren't red enough to look like the Harappan ones. They weren't black or red like the megalithic ones. They were like nothing I'd ever seen before and I couldn't quite figure out where to position them. I found a small note appended to one lot of pale gray ones that said that they had been collected by Sir Mark Oral Stein, the famous British Hungarian traveler and archeologist who was based in Lahore for many years and undertook pioneering visits through Baluchistan, the Northwest frontier, and through Central Asia, all the way up to China. There was a note on another box that said that it was a Malabar chatty, all the way from Dunhuang in China to Kandaniseri in Kerala. I certainly had my field work cut out for me. <laughs> because, I mean, I was going to be writing grant applications left, right, and center for, for visits to be able to compare these spots with different places. And of course, that kind of funding is not permissible, and nor is that kind of time available to us as art historians when you have a publication deadline. I went to call on my friend Cameron Petrie, who was in those days a DPhil student and worked had an office right next to the Ashmolean at Somerville uh, College. And he pointed me to the publications of Oral Stein, to Walter Fairservice, to Raymond Rolchin's work, uh, 
And I began to troll through excavation report after excavation report, tracing their journeys to try and see in what year they could have picked up which shard and try and establish what period, therefore, it may belong to. It was only many, many years later, 15 years later, in fact, that I got the opportunity to travel to Karachi for myself. And I found there these steel boxes lying in the excavations division of Raymond Olchins. And along with that were tons of pots that were made of exactly the same fabric that we were looking at the shards of in the Ashmolean. So 15 years later, I finally managed to identify what was in that first box of slides that was put on a trolley in one of the three trolleys that was left beside my table with a little note that said, would I consider including them in my catalog? And I was only able to really consider including them in my catalog 15 years later. The important thing about these shards is that they come from a phase of Indian civilization, which is at least a thousand years earlier than Mohenjo-daro or Harappa. So as I was saying, that was as far as the research on that first trolley's objects went. And then of course I went to the second trolley and this time life was a lot easier. They contained black and red ware pots and shards of black and red ware. Now these came from megalithic burials and I was familiar with these. They're dated broadly anywhere between 1500 and 200 BC, and they're mostly from Southern India. They had been collected by a Dr. E. H. Hunt. Hunt was a Hyderabad state medical officer who, like many others who were interested in archeology span at that time, was fascinated by the Iron Age megalithic burials in the Deccan. These spots are quite different. They are found in a burial context. They are meant to feed the spirit of the person in their next life or in the afterlife. So they're quite different from the storage jars that come from people's homes from their lifetimes. The symbolism of the motif of the pot is quite profound in Asia. They say that the only material object that the Buddha owned apart from his walking stick and his robe was a bowl, the bowl that he used to wash with the bowl that he used to feed from. It was a magical bowl that could feed many. It could feed him. It was the only material possession that he had. And legend has it that on his passing, this particular bowl went to Gandhara, where it was venerated as a great relic. And people from all over the world would come to worship at Gandhara because it was the land that had the Buddha's bowl. There are many other meanings associated with the pot in Indian philosophy. Um, in the famous ancient Indian lexicon of Sanskrit, the Amarkosh, the synonym for the word earth or bhu is kumbhini, she who is the pot. So the pot is the earth itself. Looking at these shards, I was reminded of the rather overwrought emotional outburst in a verse in the early Sangam poetry from South India. In it, there is the plight of a recently widowed woman. And she says, O potter that makes pots for the burial ground, pity my plight and show kindness to her who like a little white lizard, clinging to the spokes of the wheel that turn beside the axle pin of chariots, has in her husband's life, or in her husband's company, traversed for long the narrow and difficult path of life and condescend to make that burial urn large enough to include her in it too. Researching the quotidian has meant that one has had to act as a writer or as a curator who has used these ordinary objects to try and enliven the history of the everyday. Pots contain, or as I've tried to show in this book, they also show us something about ancient lives as fragments of possibilities for us to connect with those lives. The Japanese have a, have a wonderful term for this, for this aesthetic. They call it kintsugi. They say that the material that you use to 
join shards together to make a pothole again is the gold. It's the silver, sometimes it can be platinum or lacquer, but it is the glue that is so important, that links us with the past, that makes the story whole. So the art historian's job, perhaps rather romantically put, is rather like that kintsugi, that golden lacquer that allows us to link up these broken fragments and build a history of everyday lives, of everyday objects from people's pasts. The Ashmolean, which is perhaps one of the world's oldest museums, has been performing that role of a glue for people to be able to see their past for nearly 400 years now. And I'm going to focus towards the end of my talk on that role of the museum. The Ashmolean Museum was built on the collection started by a father and son duo of gardeners who went by the name Tredescant. And they traveled to various parts of the world and collected rare plants for an arboretum. Their actions were comparable to people in India at the same time, where Jahangir and Shah Jahan were quite interested in collecting exotica and rare plants and animals from all over the world for their menageries, but they weren't really making them available to the public. In 1637, Tirumal Nayaka in India was paying dozens of priests to also pray on his behalf and collect medicinal plants to cure diseases. Um, and it was at the same time that John Tredescant Sr. was appointed the curator of the newly founded Physic Garden at Oxford, which specialized in medicinal herbs. His son, John Tredescant Jr., gifted a substantial collection of the things that he had made for what he called his Ark, which included great rarities including Pocahontas's mantle, Pocahontas's uh, robe. He gifted these things to Elias Ashmole, who was a collector of astrological rarities and medical and historical manuscripts. And Elias Ashmole created the public museum in 1683 that we call the Ashmolean. Now, it is the world's first university museum. And when I came to work at the Department of Eastern Art in 2001, I didn't really have Pocahontas's mantle, but I did have T.E. Lawrence or the Lawrence of Arabia's robes hanging in my departmental corridor, which I had to go past every day um, as I went to my desk to work. It is bizarre because you have to think about the lives of these people like Lawrence of Arabia and others and the dramatic circumstances under which these collections were made that went on to make these kinds of museums. Today, as a collector, you go to a gallerist or to a salesman and say, I want a piece of Mauryan art or I want a piece of Gupta art. But at that time, there were no such categories that you could demand. You were just out exploring and you were looking for interesting things. And that spirit of exploration is something and gathering and collecting firsthand you couldn't go, as the government of India demands, to a licensed vendor to buy an object and have it registered. You were at the forefront of collecting things from unknown territories that were going to shape knowledge for hundreds of years to come. Their objects were at the forefront, therefore, of defining the periods that we today associate with Indian art. Sometimes their objects came from time periods and places that did not fit, as I said earlier, into any neat category. Take, for instance, this remarkable Ishkoman Valley write-on and bowl that were also collected by Oral Stein. Stylistically, it mixes Achaemenid Iranian influence with Mauryan ones, even pre-Mauryan ones. We know exceptionally little about the civilization of Swat and the Northwest frontier in the period just before the Mauryas and the Achaemenids. And these objects are really remarkable because writa or writons are commonly associated with Zoroastrianism and their kingly rituals of the Iranian Achaemenids. This older writon from Gilgit therefore hints at the presence of 
Andrew Novo Vedic and Zoroastrian communities that must have been migrating and coming into South Asia in about that 6th to 5th century BC time. So they are remarkably important because they tell us about a history of a shared community and of a type of object that we don't normally get evidence for through literary sources or through any other archaeological sources for that matter. Take another example. Many of you who will be interested in the Stone Age would have heard of the intrepid collector Robert Bruce Foote. Robert Bruce Foote is credited with having found the first Paleolithic Indian stone tool on the parade ground of Madras, which was later identified as Atirampakkam and the many quarries that have been found subsequently for Stone Age and Paleolithic tools around that part of Chennai. But few people know that a large part of Robert Bruce Foote's collection found its way to the Ashmolean. Similarly, there are other objects in the museum which have been at the forefront of defining studies on India. The earliest Indus Valley seals, for instance, Harappan seals, were not actually excavated in Harappa or Mohenjo-daro, but were found in distant Iraq, in Mesopotamian sites at Kish and at Umma, and they wound up at the Ashmolean. And they were great curiosities because they didn't look like Mesopotamian artifacts. Decades later, when Mohenjo-daro and Harappa had been excavated, it was only then, subsequently, that we could look at these objects and figure out that they must have been traded from Indus Valley sites to Mesopotamian ones, and then excavated by us in the 20th century in Mesopotamia. In fact, one of these seal impressions made of clay is particularly good evidence for that because the back of the seal impression also carries an impression, but this time of a jute bag. So perhaps it was an object that was used to seal a bag of grain or produce that was going from somewhere in the Indus Valley that traveled all the way to Mesopotamia. So as I was saying, we can't really separate the history of these objects from the history of the circumstances and the people who collected these objects and where they were collected and when they were collected. Let me give you yet another example of this type. These Neolithic tools that you're looking at now were collected by somebody called John Lubbock. Lubbock was amongst the most famous members of Victorian society who was Charles Darwin's own pupil. And he was married to Augustus Pitt Rivers' daughter. Now Pitt Rivers, for those of you who know, also founded a museum, which is the famous Pitt Rivers Museum of Oxford. So Pitt Rivers' daughter was married to Lubbock. And Lubbock is remembered today through his very famous proposal of regulating Britain's shop hours. He also created the concept of bank holidays. In fact, both of these were instituted through Acts of Parliament. Now, apart from various scientific clubs and societies, Lubbock was also a member of something called the X Club. This remarkable club had a few select members. Darwin, Pitt Rivers, Lubbock, Thomas Henry Huxley, and five others. It was a gentleman's only dining club of the most influential of Victorian Britain's businessmen, intellectuals, and bankers who would meet on the first Thursday of every month, either at the Athenaeum or St. George's Hotel or at Armand's Hotel to practically plot and make plans that would swerve public opinion in favor of rationality, in favor of science, of the laws of natural selection, and moving people away from religious propaganda and giving them a more scientific temper. Now, I never really had the good fortune of knowing Karl Khandalawala, but today, as I deliver the 22nd memorial lecture in his honor, I wonder if he, as a former director, would have supported my idea of setting up a new X club for the city of Mumbai here at the CSMVS.
These influential men in their time had friends who were spread all over the British Empire at its height, and through them they had amassed formidable collections. Just as the Ashmolean and such museum collections proved instrumental in shaping public opinion and bringing a more rational view of history in religion and society. One wonders whether our museums in India are going to take that initiative and that responsibility. What will it take for our collectors and curators to really start using these objects to start researching and educating the public? But equally, you can look at these objects and these collectors and their legacy in a very different light. And that's an equally important paradoxical and sad light. They reflect the aggrandizement and the ambition of the British Empire. However, I think looking at them only through that lens would be a limiting view of the richness of the collections and their contribution in shaping our knowledge. I agree, it's all very well to have a bit of a laugh about these very patriarchal, gentlemen's only ex-clubs. But we also have to remember that power, money, patriarchal control and colonization, was, which was associated with these collectors and their collecting habits, would be absolutely unacceptable to us today. Hundreds and hundreds of objects in the Pit Rivers or in the Ashmolean collections were, for instance, formed by somebody called Haywood Seaton Carr. Seaton Carr served in the army. He was an avid traveler, an amateur archaeologist. He was also a painter, but he was also a very serious hunter who made more than 50 expeditions to hunt big game in Somaliland, as well as many hunting expeditions to India. He amassed his collections of artifacts in the course of these travels. It was on one of these hunting expeditions in Somaliland that he found lots of tiny little small worked flints that he picked up along the way. And he recognized that these looked a lot like the small flints that were being excavated at that time in France, which were being used by Darwin to prove that our species had originated from Neanderthals and from an older hominids. So just as this man was busy exterminating other species, he was also finding the secrets of our species. And it is these kinds of paradoxes that we as scholars have to be able to share with our public. Many such paradoxes, in fact, began to emerge in my research. But perhaps one of the saddest paradoxes of all was that these collections were being made by enterprising individuals without any support from institutions, without any support from the geological survey or from the archaeological survey of the countries in which they were exploring. They were left to use their own resources to get on with the job. And the government has never really backed this kind of research. In fact, it can be said that many of them did not come from wealthy backgrounds, but they were just highly educated and curious and intrepid individuals who had to make these collections in spite of the many obstacles that were being put in their path by the institutions of that time. In today's talk, I've tried to show that it's not just important to study the collections and the objects, but also to try and pay attention to the remarkable circumstances and the contexts in which the collectors themselves were operating that have enabled museums like this to exist, because their stories are as much a part of researching the quotidian as it is to look at the objects themselves. My primary focus, however, has been on how even the most modest objects have rich stories to tell. My next intention was to show you how to deal with primary source material, how to be able to research it and what does it take to be able to investigate those pieces. How do we familiarize ourselves with the archeology span and the fabric of the piece itself? And then we have to come into the interpretations of those objects to be able to see the kind of superstitions, the kind of rituals, the kind of everyday desires of people that we can use to be able to tell their lives. Some of the objects seem to be made out of molds. Were their cities so populous that they needed multiple impressions for mass production to be able to fill their needs? 
Some of the objects, on the other hand, are so carefully worked and individually made that they take us right into the individual handwriting of that abbot or that lay monk who worked in that monastery. I think my greatest luck by chance, as they say in India, was stumbling into this wonderful world of objects. And I'm going to leave you with a little bit of that luck by chance, as one would have it. It was one day in the Ashmolean that I looked at this little object that carried a very safe label with it that said it had been found in Mohenjo-daro. But it hadn't been found in a secure excavation. It's a little die. And I knew that games of dice had been found in many ancient contexts, but because this was a surface collection, there was no guarantee that this object was actually 5,000 years old, just because it had been found on the surface of Mohenjo-daro. Right? It could be a modern object that was lying scattered over there. And so began another hornet's nest of research on ancient games, games that have been used for prediction, games that have been used by children. Dice are very ancient, and both types of dice, cubical ones and the long bar-shaped ones, have been found in the Bronze Age from total historic settlements. Gaming pieces and gaming counters have been recovered from most Harappan sites. However, this dice was really remarkable because the sum of the opposite sides is seven. So you've got five opposite two, six opposite one, and three opposite four, just as you do in modern dice. That really was a bit of a thrill. To know that I was rolling in my hands an object of someone else's reverie, someone else's pastime, someone else's game of chance. Something that has been consistently used in much the same way for somebody's time out for thousands of years. In fact, in India, we know that it's not just time out, is it? If Yudhishthir hadn't quite rolled the dice as he had, the fate of Bharatvarsh or India would have been quite different. And so that's what I mean by luck by chance. As a curator, we're building narratives for the public on the research of the quotidian. And we have to be open to the possibilities of many such games. Thank you all very much. You've been very patient in hearing me ramble on through this. But just as I end, I have a couple of thank yous that I really, really want to say. The first is to Randolph and Marjorie Boxall, who I remember extremely fondly because they supported me and a lot of the research that went into the writing of this catalogue. I'd also like to remember and thank my research assistants who have helped me along the way, Avani Sood, Shweta Wahi, Sanjukta Datta, Anjali Duhan. You've all been there and helped me in many ways. And finally, I want to thank my family. I think they were the ones who've been like a real pillar waiting for this book to finally finish when they thought that it would never see the light of day. Thank you all very much. Good night.